Hello everyone and um, welcome to the last Foresight Sanity Preserver. So the, the last of the salons of this kind uh, from tomorrow morning on at 11 a.m. Uh, PT, we're going to switch into the Foresight Hive Mind, where instead of uh, trying to make sense of COVID-19 and showcase projects that are in need of support right now, uh, we're actually going to flip more into action mode and going to discuss uh, what are kind of like short-term and very, very long-term opportunities uh, for better futures that we can seek in COVID-19 right now. Uh, for now, I'm incredibly happy to have Daniel Bocha here with us today to close the series out with a bang. Daniel is a Foresight uh, Fellow in Health and Human Longevity. Uh, he's the 2020 uh, Foresight Fellow, um, and he's, uh, I think, one of the more, more distinguished fellows that we ever had. Just, you know, to kind of like name drop one thing, he has been selected a young scientist at the 68th Lindau Nobel Laureate meeting. That's an honor that was extended to 600 of the most promising biomedical scientists worldwide. Um, he has a BS in biochemistry and a master of science in biophysics with distinction. And, uh, you know, he's been really using, I think, this uh, kind of like um, very deep understanding to then now really broaden that understanding by using currently machine learning to try to make sense of the dark matter in biology, which are glycans. So he is going to talk a lot about that today, uh, not only about why are they neglected right now, but how, how complex are they, how can we use machine learning to actually make sense of them, but then also why would we even care about them? Why are they important uh, to figure out uh, different uh, uh, virus strains and what glycans can, bi can bind to it, how is it relevant for their diagnostic value, but also uh, what therapeutics, uh, what, what therapeutic value uh, is uncovered by glycans, um, uh, potentially by developing glycan-based antivirals. And then we're going to talk a little bit more about like long-term uh, consequences for health and agriculture uh, that uh, glycans may unlock for us. So uh, it's going to be quite, I think, uh, um, yeah, a, a, quite a trailblazing uh, new talk. I'm super, super happy to have you here. Thank you so much for making time. And I think we're going to dive right into it. Thank you and welcome, Daniel. I'm going to share your pretty extensive bio in the chat and can't wait for the discussion. Thank you very much for the nice introduction. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen and get started, basically. Um, so, and of course, we will take questions at the end. But if you have any, if you don't understand anything during the talk, then feel free to ask. I don't want to lose you on the way. Um, so my background is in is in biology traditionally, but I've I've pivoted to artificial intelligence, machine learning a while ago, and and that's why my research is at the moment. Um, so this talk is basically sort of tripartite. So in the first part, I will I will just give you a background on on what I'm doing research on. In the second part, then I'm talking about my actual work and some of my results. And then the third part, I'm, I'm relating that to COVID-19 and how it could be relevant for that and for other diseases as well. So um, like, I said, like I said, my background is in biology. So, so I'm, I'm just starting with biology basics and I hope I don't lose too many people on the way. Hopefully no one. So there are basically three types of biological sequences. Um, and a lot of people are familiar with at least two of them with high school or extended education, et cetera. So the first one is our nucleic acids, so DNA or RNA. So these are the these helices and for, for DNA at least, and they carry your genetic information and they're, they're essential for all kinds of uh, known life at least. Um, very simple in makeup, just four building blocks that just uh, go on and on and on in, 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 in certain configurations to so then clothing or, or proteins and for other molecules. And then proteins are of course the second kind of biological sequence. So these are actually the, the molecules that perform the executive functions of cells and organisms. So they are, they are enzymes that, that break down nutrients or, or build up macromolecules for the cell to use and to expand. Or something. And these two kinds of, of biological sequences are very familiar to, to most people. So both researchers as well as, as, as the educated public. The third kind is, is even unfamiliar to, to most researchers. So I, I all the time I have to explain to researchers what they actually are or, or do. So these are our glycans, and that's actually what I'm working on at the moment. So glycans are, if you want to call them, like that, they're sugars, basically. So every symbol there that you can see is, is, a, is a sugar that is linked to multiple other sugars, and that forms these, these chains. So I, I told you DNA has four constituents, proteins have 20, glycans have thousands. So they are the most diverse biological sequence, and they're, they're also the most abundant in terms of just sheer mass. So most of the cell walls are made up of glycans. So, and of course, cellulose is also a glycan and a lot of other macromolecules that make up a lot of bulk mass. But apart from bulk mass, glycans are also very important for function. 
because they're attached to all other macromolecules and they also can occur by themselves. And the important thing here is, as you can already see, they're branched. So they're the only nonlinear biological sequence that we, that we know of in, a, in a, any, any relevant situs. Um, so that makes them very hard to work with. And on top of that, their diversity. So, so that was really also for me just a technically challenging issue. And I will tell you in a couple of slides why they're also so important. So it's not only a technically challenging issue, but it's also a very worthwhile pursuit to actually try to develop models to understand lichens from a functional perspective. Um, and also, so DNA and proteins are part of this, it's called central dogma of molecular biology, and it relates to the flow of information that happens in, in the cellular system. So information flows from DNA through RNA into proteins, and then the proteins fulfill functions that are encoded in their, in their, in their genes, basically. Lichens are, as of now, uh, at least officially outside the central dogma of molecular biology, because they are not assembled according to a strict code. Rather, it's a very complex interplay uh, between um, enzymes and cellular conditions. So that, that makes them very plastic, very dynamic. And actually, a lot of people speculate that this is a reason why we could evolve to multicellular organisms, because we only, at, at least with humans, we only have around 20,000-ish genes. But with glycans, we, you, can, you can just modify all the proteins that you produce from those genes and modulate their function, modulate their half-life, and, and thereby get a lot more expressivity than just by, by, the, by the number of genes. And so they're really, if you, if you, if you get accustomed to glycans, you notice they're everywhere. So this is, a, this is a picture of a human cell. And at first you might think it has hairs, but they're actually glycans. So the, the whole exterior of human cells is just, it's just encapsulated in a forest of glycans. And that is true for every kind of cell. So also bacteria and fungi, all of them are, their, their exterior surface is basically coated in glycans. So every interaction that, has, that happens between cells, between, between life forms, basically has to involve glycans more or less because they're just so prevalent in the outside. That makes them really, really important for host pathogen interactions and basically for every kind of disease that you can think of that, that way. Uh, apart from, from just being involved in interactions, they're also functionally important. So just two, two very short vignettes about where they are important in biology. And one is in mucosal membranes. So membranes that you have on, on your gut, for instance, but also on your respiratory system and all, all kinds of mucosal membranes that you can think of. And those, those, this mucus this, is really like basically a slime which just coats all the surfaces and the slime is made up of glycans. And so what, what it does is it basically selects a, a certain microbiome for this environment and it does it by, via several ways. So that it basically provides attachment knobs for microbes that, that, uh, that are beneficial for the gut to attach to. And it also provides nutrition because some microbes can degrade this, uh, this mucus layer and thereby get nutrients out of the glycans. And, and this is one, one of the ways that our body basically selects a certain kind of microbiome and keeps it stable uh, across time and, and uh, geography. And, and another very important uh, aspect of microbiology is, is the immune system, especially in uh, higher eukaryotes like ourselves. So if you think about antibodies, for instance, which are one of the predominant mechanisms of immunity that we, that we possess, so like, antibodies are decorated with glycans that modulate their efficacy and their half-life, their stability. So there are actually now companies that try to, to, to capitalize on that and change the, the, the glycans on those antibodies for improved efficacy. So for instance, Roche has a, a, a bought Glycard a, a startup a, a while ago that just specializes in this kind of technology. And, and it's not only in antibodies, also cancer cells, for instance, use that. So by basically signaling to the immune system don't eat me uh, just by, by producing glycans that are, that are just making the, the immune system stop attacking those kinds of cells. So this could, so it has, a, has a lot of therapeutic um, applicability as well, um, especially if this field um, keeps on developing um, because right now we, we are still sort of at the beginning of understanding, at least on a, on a very mechanistic level, uh, what are the functional implications of this. And one of the reasons, as I've already mentioned, is that glycans are incredibly diverse. So this is just a, a ridiculously small um, screenshot of the, the number of building blocks that are making up glycans. So in total, we, are, we have assembled around close to a, a bit more than a thousand, but we don't think we are anywhere near saturation of building blocks. So if you just do the, the math, then you get already over one trillion potential glycans of size three. Just to put that in the context, if you actually compare that to the other biological sequences, 
it's insanely um, more diverse. And this is a logarithmic axis. So it's, so any difference there is huge. And what, what, I, what I also should mention is that this only considers linear glycans. So as soon as you have branching, which the other biological sequences don't have, this will go up at orders of magnitude. So, so glycans are just insanely more, more diverse than, than proteins or DNA, uh, which is, I mean, I mean it's, it's, just, it's just insane that the people don't look at glycans in the same way that they do at proteins or DNA, just because of the potential that this would have also for, for engineering purposes, for, for um, intervention as well as then um, to also diagnostic purposes. And that's why we wanted to capitalize on that really. Um, so we, we basically treated the biological sequence as a language because it has structure, it has order, effects, it has patterns. So in a way is, I mean, of course it's not a, it's a per se a language, but it's analogous enough to a language that methods that are applied to natural languages can also be applied to those kinds of biological sequences. People have been doing that with DNA, with RNA, with proteins, but glycans have as of yet um, stymied researchers because of branching, so nonlinearity, so you can't just simply go from left to right and because of the diversity. Um, so we basically gathered a whole bunch of glycan data, glycan sequences, and and applied recurrent neural networks, which is a, a standard technology for, for natural language processing and associated machine learning and artificial intelligence, and tried to just get a hold of um, what are sort of the, the rules of, of, of glycan sequences and, and can we get some functions or functional characteristics out of that. Um, so, and, and the first thing that our model learned, and I don't want to get too much into, into, into details, but uh, so basically the bonds that connect monosaccharides, so the, the building blocks of glycans, these sugars, are of course very different from the sugars themselves. And that's one of the first things that the model learns. It just tightly groups the, the, the bonds apart from all the, the um, sugars. So a language model per se is, is interesting in itself because you can already look at distribution of glycans and of patterns. And that's what, what we did. We basically looked at, so in orange, you see the glycans of length three that we see in nature, at least in our, in our data set. Um, in blue, you see just a snapshot of what is possible, what could be there in terms of, of the alphabet that we know in glycans. And so the first thing is it's, it's an infinitesimally small number of glycans from the potential glycans that are observable and also they're non-random. So nature chose basically uh, non-random paths through this co very complex glycan space that you can imagine. So that also means that actually a lot of glycan space has not been explored at all yet. And this, this, this would offer tremendous opportunities hopefully for, for future applications that then tries to tame that diversity or for using it as, as therapeutics as I will go into in the la later part of the talk um, and also to understand why maybe this only this space has been sampled. Um, so we use that actually, so this is a language model. So what you can do now is you can use the, the in insights that you gained from uh, these sequences and, and actually apply it to a predictive model. And one of the applications that we looked at is xenotransplantation. So this is an endeavor that tries to grow organs in pigs and then transplant these organs into humans. And so the, it's, it's, it sounds like a really great idea, right? Because you have a basically an unlimited supply of organs that way. But one of the issues, of course, is, is uh, transplant rejection because our immune system recognizes these organ, organs to be foreign and therefore then just uh, attacks them. And actually one of the main determinants of that immunogenicity is, uh, or are glycans. So the pig glycans are recognized as foreign um, because they use different building blocks, because they use them in different orientations. And so our immune system is, uh, readily recognizes them and, and rejects those organs. And there, there, is, there are research efforts to that extent to making transgenic pigs where they knock out some of the genes that are responsible for making these pig glycans. And thereby the organs are less immunogenic, but we are still not there yet, uh, at least fully. So what we did is we basically trained the model and tried to predict just from the glycan sequence, is it, is it immunogenic or how immunogenic is it to humans? Um, and, and that's something that, that couldn't be done before basically because you didn't really have these machine learning types of models for glycans yet, but now we can do them qu quite readily and we can, we can just rank the pig glycans that are known uh, according to how likely the model thinks they are, that they are immunogenic. And if you look at the, the least immunogenic glycans, and you just believe me on that, but they look very similar to human glycans. So the, no problem there, the immune system has, has no issue with that. But with the most immunogenic glycans, uh, we were actually quite excited about that because we recap recapitulated a lot of the insights that people in the xenotransplantation field had um, in terms of what are problematic patterns and, and um, building blocks. So, we'd be, so for instance, this turquoise, uh, um, shape there is one of the building blocks that people are, try, are trying to get rid of 
in pig lichens. And, and it has been shown that this reduces immunogenicity by quite a bit. Um, and we also found, found additional patterns that, that could be the next frontier of making these pig organs even less immunogenic and thereby bringing them closer to fruition. Um, we also um, went a bit into evolutionary studies in a sense, and, and because like, since lichens are so important for these host pathogen interactions, they are uh, subject to a lot of evolutionary pressures. And um, because, uh, because most pathogens use lichens to enter cells, so we tried to capitalize on that and, and find some, some of those pathogenicity determinants by building a model that can predict, given a glycan sequence, where does it come from in terms of species? Um, and we actually use that to, to study pathogenic motifs in, in uh, bacteria like Staph aureus and, and other that are um, basically uh, using some of these motifs to fool our immune system to, to avoid being targeted by different domains of our immune system. And, um, and, we, and, and another thing that you can do with that is actually look at the tree of life from a, from a glycan-based perspective. Uh, there, there are actually, um, so there, there is this interesting quote by, by Lubchansky that says that nothing in biology makes sense uh, um, without evolution. And, and the, 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 there is a paper that puts this into the context of glycans where, um, saying that nothing in glycobiology makes sense except in the light of evolution. And I think that's really true because, uh, because since glycans are so dynamic and plastic, a lot of our, of our evolutionary capacity is probably due to glycans. And therefore we can, uh, we, we can reconstruct a lot of the ancestries as, as shown here, just based on glycan sequences now with our method. Um, so now I, I want to switch gears and go to coronavirus uh, very, very abruptly. Um, so coronaviruses, uh, glycans are important for coronavirus from, a, from, a, from multiple aspects. And one of them is uh, that, that they are just attached to coronavirus proteins. And so what is shown here is the spike protein of coronavirus. This is uh, the protein that actually makes contact with cells and that allows coronavirus to enter cells. And every, and every one of those colored patches on the, on the spike protein is, is a glycan, basically. So, so you can already appreciate that a lot of the surface of the, of the protein is made up of glycans. Um, so, and additionally, these glycans are mostly derived from human cells because most viruses don't have the capacity to produce their own glycans. So, so meaning that uh, it, they, they actually use this sort of as a, as a, as a double whammy because first they, they let the cells produce the glycans and thereby take away energy from the cells, but they also decorate their proteins with human-like glycans and thereby also fool the immune system, which now doesn't know anymore if this is a foreign protein or not. But, but the thing is that, that actually a lot of people are not taking these glycans into account when they design vaccines or, or antibodies against these kinds of proteins. And, as you, and if, you, if you ignore such a large degree of the, of the surface coverage when you design a therapeutic intervention, then um, I'm sure you are going to have a, a very bad time. Um, so, and, and this is, this is a, a larger issue that is, that is true for a lot of vaccine and antibody production that the glycans are not factored in at the, at the moment. Um, another very important issue that I'm come to, coming to in the next slide will require a bit of background. So these are blood groups, um, the, the major ABO blood group types, which are, by the way, also glycans. Uh, I've, just as an aside, I've made this observation that uh, a lot of people are working on glycans, but they don't know it. Um, because you just never bother to, to just sort of think about what their molecules are actually. So, so I mean, when, when, I, when I first got to know all about these glycans about a year ago or something, I, 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 was, I was just amazed at where they pop up basically at every corner in biology. So, so in that sense, I think they're really a bit like the dark matter of biology that they're, that they're making up a lot of mass, actual mass and diversity, but they're not factored in. And we can't really yet explain their, their precise um, contribution to function and, and mechanism because we lack the methods and we lack, we lack the, the, the framework and the data. For it. Um, so blood group determinants. So uh, the ABO system um, is our, our glycans and they're just uh, dependent on what, what genes you have. Um, if you can synthesize the, the given glycans that are shown here. Um, and what is interesting from, from what I think is interesting here is on the left-hand side, you see alpha-gal. This is actually one of the best known um, Immune, uh, immune, immunogenic motifs in glycans. So around 1% of your entire antibody repertoire is directed against alpha-gal, but it has a striking resemblance to blood group B. So, so this, is, this shows you already how, how non-trivial it is to assign function and immunogenicity by extent to- It has a similarity to what did you say you dropped out? Oh, sorry, the, the similarity to blood group B. Uh -huh. Yeah, um, so, so our immune system is, is very capable of recognizing alpha-gal, but, uh, 
but it's, it doesn't recognize black group B, it, at least if you have black group B, of course. Um, so the important thing now is that this is actually highly relevant for, for the susceptibility to infection by coronavirus. Um, so there was a study recently that, that looked at uh, the population distribution of, of blood groups compared to the infections of coronavirus. And people with blood group O were, were, were to, to a certain degree at least protected from infection by coronavirus, whereas, whereas those of group, blood group A were more susceptible than their distribution would suspect you um, to, to, to be. And if you, if you look at that, it's, it's, it's actually sort of a subtle difference but it, it, it leads to quite a difference in terms of susceptibility. And this is a general phenomenon, by the way, for, for pathogens, that blood groups affect the infection rate susceptibility. And there is a, there is a reason for that, because uh, so the, the, in terms of antibody distribution and also in terms of um, cross-reactivity. So for instance, if you, let's say you're a blood group A person and you're infected by, by a virus such as coronavirus, so you produce viruses, and if you if you remember, these viruses will have glycans produced from the cell on their surface. So they will also have blood group A glycans now on their surface. So if they now infect a, a person with blood group B, their immune system will recognize the foreign blood group and therefore, uh, at least to a large degree, eliminate the, the virus. And um, this has been shown for a, for a range of viruses that this um, cross compatibility of blood groups is an important factor. And as far as I know, at least it's not factored in, in, in any of the epidemiological spreading models, um, which could maybe make them more precise after all. Uh, and then uh, as, a, as, a, as another note of, of, of quite importance is, is actual cell entry. So this is herpes, herpes virus, but uh, the, same is, the same basic mechanism is true of, of coronavirus. Um, so herpes virus has, of course, a protein receptor, the same as coronavirus receptors. So anyone worth their salt will tell you that this is ACE2 for coronavirus, a protein that actually binds to coronavirus and leads to cell entry, which is all well and good. But what people either neglect to mention or maybe don't even are, maybe not, are not even aware of is that the, the initial contact, the coronavirus and also herpes virus and a range of other viruses like HIV and uh, Zika make are with, with glycans. Uh, and in, in, in the case of the viruses that I just mentioned, this is heparin sulfate. It's a, a quite an elongated uh, glycan that is attached to a protein and, and that is, is very negatively charged and, and makes, makes initial contact with the virus. And then once the virus is bound to the cell, it will then make subsequent contact with the protein receptors and, and then fuse with membrane and enter the cell. Uh, and so people are working on, on inhibiting the binding of ACE2, coronavirus to, to ACE2, but uh, actually further upstream would be the binding to heparin sulfate. And, and this would, would make a, a lot of sense to inhibit this binding first, which could lead to a, a way more potent therapeutic in a sense, um, which again is, is something that, that uh, could be capitalized from a glycan perspective. And, and this is not an isolated phenomenon. So this is true for other viruses. It is also true for a lot of bacteria, for toxins. So also neurotoxins like botulinum toxin, et cetera. They all recognize their cells via glycans and then are, are taken in by the cell, basically. Which I think is, is, is frankly crazy that this has not been capitalized more for, for therapeutics. Um, and you can even, so, so we, we, are, we are currently engaged in a project looking at, at viruses, uh, so not specifically coronavirus as of yet, because there are unfortunately not as much data from a glycan perspective as you would like to. But um, like I said, many, glycan, many viruses share propensity to bind to glycans and enter cells via that. So I just share with you a small vignette with um, influenza virus, which of course also enters cells via glycans. So the, the natural reservoir of um, influenza are birds, specifically aquatic birds like ducks, for instance. And in order to, to switch to humans, uh, a few mutations that are, that are quite well characterized need to happen, are, are necessary to switch host um, range, basically. And these mutations have as an effect that they, that they change the binding specificity of influenza and thereby they recognize different glycans. So before they recognize duck glycans and then after these mutations, they can recognize human glycans, which are obviously different. Um, so this already shows you that this is a necessary uh, step that has to happen before, before something can spill over. Um, the, the glycans are quite important. And even if it's just from a monitoring perspective, if you monitor the, the, the reservoirs and see if something is likely to spread, if something could become the next wave or next pandemic, et cetera. And for this, we are, we are currently in the process of building a model that for any given virus strain can basically predict 
which glycans can it bind? And, and this is sort of like a, a very straightforward pipeline and it has a, a ton of applications, both diagnostic and prognostic, but also therapeutic. And from a diagnostic perspective, it's basically not, to, not only telling you which organism is it affecting, but it, it can also tell you which, which tissue or which, or which organ um, a virus is affecting, because this will also uh, have their own like repertoire basically, and you can just, then just cross-reference that. And but if you compare that to, to existing viruses and their known binding profiles, it can also tell you a lot about how, how bad could it be, right? And, and you can then design better binding glycans and just basically go the virus away from the cells and just stop the viral cell entry via, uh, via then using glycans as, as therapeutics. Um, and so I, I basically with a, with a closing note, I just want to sort of encourage everyone to, uh, to or look into glycans or, or invest into glycans because I, I assure you they're, they're worthwhile for many, many applications. And I've shown you here a lot of health applications, but I'm also very excited about, about a whole range of other applications. For instance, agriculture um, uh, applications because the, the nitrogen fixating microbes in the roots of plants are interacting with the plants via glycans and they're, they're signaling um, uh, vice versa and, and also attaching themselves via glycans. And I think this is a in, in an incredibly exciting space, which is basically wholly untapped at the moment because we lack the infrastructure, the methods and the data as of yet, but, but that's what uh, people like me are hopefully here for to extend that. And uh, so I, I just want to sort of wrap this up by um, just sh sharing my love for glycans, which uh, I think are incredibly important for biology, yet incredibly underappreciated. And they, for me, they, they really are a treasure trove because they, they, are, they, they could be important for a whole range of of disciplines and applications from diagnostic to therapeutic and also just for basic biology to really understand how do biological systems work and how do uh, from a mechanistic perspective and um, from a holistic perspective because if we ignore a lot of the diversity in the mass that is present in biology then I, I think we it's quite hopeless to, to try to understand these complex systems and with that I, I want to, to thank my, my, my collaborators here um, and of course, our, our funding institutions. And I want to thank you for your attention. And I'm happy to take any questions. And I'm sorry, I ignore the, all the, the comments that were posted in the chat. So I don't know if any questions were posted there. Thank you so much, Daniel. This was fantastic. Wow. OK, little did I know all the, <laughs> like, really little did I know. Um, that, that sounds like, uh, you know, really quite incredibly like neglected uh, and, uh, and undervalued for their potential benefit. Uh, like Creon uh, just came up with five questions on the fly. So I want to uh, want to give, give, give the mic to Creon, please. Okay, thank you. Fascinating presentation on a subject that I have been fascinated about for a long time, but uh, never really dove into. Um, so great, you'll be hearing from me probably in email after this as well. So a couple of questions. First of all, um, in no particular order, you know, we all know that the store, the main, do the central dogma and how proteins on the, at the very grossest level, how proteins are coded for. How are, uh, how are these glycans and their proteoglycan conglomerates, how is that coded for? And that leads into, of course, the question of how are they constructed in the cell and, um, it's obviously much more complicated, but could you just maybe briefly explain in contrast to say the standard transcription and translation and post-translational modification for proteins, how are the glycans with their increased complexity and the fact that they're not explicitly coded in the genome, how did they get set up correctly? Yeah, thanks. That's a great question. I think this will be a really important issue going forward to really nail that down precisely. So if I, if I just take the example of, of N-glycans, which are one of the predominant classes in eukaryotic glycans, uh, such as human glycans, of course. Um, so they are usually, what, what, what is happening is that you, that you produce sort of like a substrate glycan. So this is a, a standard tree that you just uh, transfer wholesale to proteins. Um, and then you narrow it down and extend it. So you use that sort of as your, as your, as your baseline and then you extend that. And, and it's usually a stochastic process. So, so there, there are studies that, 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 have been sh that have shown that during the transition through the Golgi, there are enzymes that attach and detach certain sugars from these trees. But the, since the transition time is so short, they can't go to enzymatic completion. So you will always have a distribution of glycoforms on a given protein. Um, and even, 
different sites on, a, on, this, on the same protein will have different distributions because of the accessibility of enzymes. So this is actually, so, and that's why there have been no really good models as of now to predict the repertoire of glycans based on um, the available enzymes. There are certain niche cases where you can do that. For instance, for certain bacterial glycans, you have gene clusters where you have, uh, so for lipopolysaccharide, for, for, for the um, O antigen um, portions, basically, you have, you have gene clusters which are responsible for making these specific lichen sequences. And that's, and then that's just an enzymatic order. But, but in general, it's a highly nonlinear combination that is very, um, in a sense, fragile because it can easily be disturbed by extracellular metabolites and signaling, et cetera. But that also allows a cell to really react very spontaneously to everything. Okay, next question related. When you want to mess around with them in the lab, how do you make them? Do you just fool around with these, with the genome and the, and the, and the epigenome and try to get bacteria to do it for you? Or do you pre precision synthesize very particular glycans in the lab? And then what the heck do you do with them? Like, how do you get them to be attached and, and activated? Yeah, so there has been tons of progress on, on that front in, in recent years. So, so there, there are several approaches, of course. So there is people like Mike Dewitt that, that try to synthesize it based on enzymes in, in a, in a cell-free extract, basically. So by, by, by a combinatorial um, a synthesis of, of, no, of enzymes with known specificities to build it up. Um, but, but there are also uh, um, approaches that, that try to engineer cells to, to just produce whole, whole arrays of, of glycans. Um, and, and it's, it's still not really as easy as recombinant protein expression, of course. So you can't really put in a cDNA and, and expect to get a uh, defined output. But at least you, you can get a, a certain range of, of um, glycans. And then what you can do is you can attach those to slides. So there are, there's this method that's called glycan array. And that's just a chemical coupling of glycans to glass slides and, uh, or, or other arrays use lipid um, layers, basically. And then you can... You can just flow proteins over that, etc. So the combinatorial approach obviously uh, is holds sway in this field. Uh, yeah. Something. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm going to skip over a bunch of my questions, which I think were implicit in the previous questions, and then uh, ask the last two. First of all, so there's there's the glycans kind of free, and they get incorporated onto some of these proteins, for instance, like spike proteins and a trillion other things. Then there's glycolipids, right, which you didn't talk much about, and then there's like the the big one, or like in a sense, what sounds like the most complicated one, which is like glycolipid proteins. I'm not sure what they're actually called, but things that are a combination of all three classes of molecules. Can you say briefly, is that true? And if so, what are their relative importance? Yeah, so a so, uh, brief aside about glycolipids, I think they're highly relevant, especially for, for um, uh, immun immunological issues. Uh, and there is this great work by, by Dennis Casper and, and, and others about their effect on the, on the immune system. Um, so what you're referring as the, the third class is uh, probably the glycosaminoglycans. So these are, are these um, stuff like heparin sulfate and, and, and other um, connective tissue um, molecules. They're, they're, us they're usually very long and very complex. And, and they, they basically, um, and so, so what is really interesting there is that they are a code in, in themselves. So they, they have these modifications of sulfate groups on, on the chain. But they, they don't have it in a in a fully repeating fashion, but rather in a in a more information rich capacity, and and there there have been recent efforts to sequence these molecules basically uh, to to get at their information, and uh, and I'm very excited for that data to really pile up so that you can build predictive models based on that. Because as I said, a lot of viruses bind to these molecules, and and, and I'm sure there are a lot of biological processes that are also dependent on those. Fascinating. I didn't know about that sulfite stuff. Okay, and then um, last question. This is a little bit more speculative and a little bit more into maybe my passion area, which is uh, presumably in at least some cases in terms of at least the gut microbiome as well as the lining of the gut with all those glycans, but maybe also mucous membranes. And also I know for the uh, epith vascular epithelial layers, your diet and the amount of sugar, quote unquote, that you have in your diet can really affect the uh, glycan profile of various tissue types. Is that true? Do you know anything about that? And what do you think about that? Yeah, yeah, I think that's a really exciting frontier. For instance, if, if you remember the, the turquoise shape on, on, the, on, the, on the pig glycans, 
This is actually, so this is a building block that we humans don't produce. Uh, we lost that ability. So other mammals do like pigs, for instance, and also like other primates. Uh, but if we eat that, since it's so similar to other um, building blocks that we have, we can still metabolically incorporate that into our own glycans. And then we, of course, we, we present those on the cell surface. And there, are, there have been really interesting speculations that this is one of the reasons why red meat leads to these inflammatory um, problems, because then we get an autoimmune reaction to glycans on our own cells that have incorporated this turquoise uh, monosaccharide into their own glycans. And, and I would be- that, could, you, could you slowly repeat the name of that chemical, please? It's, uh, it's, it's called, uh, so the, the abbreviation is new NGC, and it's, it's N-glycolyl neuraminic acid. NGC. Okay, thank you. I was thinking, I was wondering more about if the sugar content of one's bloodstream or diet or whatever might have an effect on the uh, glycan dynamics and profile of one's tissues. So, so you, you mean in the, in, the, in the gut lining? Wherever. I mean, look, it's kind of well known that like diabetics who have a lot of sugar circulating in their blood, blood mm -hmm get bacterial infections that go crazy. Now, is that just so simple as the bacteria are feeding on the glucose or is there something more complicated going on with glycans that's also leading to that problem? So, so it's definitely true that if you have very high concentrations of, of any given sugar in your bloodstream that, that you get additional reactions with proteins of that sugar. So that sugar will attach itself to proteins. And that is actually also one of the ways that is that um, in diabetes, the, the patients are monitored by the level of, of uh, modified proteins um, with, with, with yeah. mm -hmm. In yeah. fact, HGHC is a basic glycoprotein, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you. I'm done. Thank you. All right. We have a lot of questions from Ted up next. Thanks, uh, Daniel. It's interesting um, presentation. I have two questions. Um, first, I'm, I'm particularly interested in how microscopic robots that eventually might make could recognize and interact with cells. And I was struck by the image you showed of a cell with the, with the hair on it that, that you mentioned were glycans on the cell surface. And I was trying to understand a bit better, better what the scale is of what you were showing, because I was wondering whether those glycans would also cover extended structures like cilia or flagella that bacteria have to, to go around, or, or are, the, the, are those much larger than what you were showing in, in, in that diagram? So, so, so glycans definitely also cover the cilia and flagella of bacteria. Um, I'm a bit uncertain as of the length and scale. So, so bacteria are, are definitely qu uh, quite different from, from mammalians in, in terms of their, of their glycans. So they're, they're the, the, the cell membrane and, and the cell wall actually take a predominant amount of the glycans. Um, so so in, in a way, this is even more important for bacteria than it is for, for human cells, their actual exterior layer of um, of glycans. And then, wait again, so the first question was? So the, so the idea would be if you, if you have, if you had a device, let's say like a little oh, robot yeah, yeah. That, yeah. that's trying uh -huh. to recognize a cell or interact with the main thing that it would be interacting with initially would be glycans on the surface, as opposed to more extended structures like cilia, say. Yeah. So I'm wondering yeah. what scale would, it would, the interaction would happen. Because these would be so, much bigger than viruses. They would be like bacteria size. Say. Okay, yeah, but so I, I think they could still um, attach to the glycans in a sense because there are a lot of binding proteins mm -hmm. um, that recognize specific motifs of glycans. And usually those are not very, um, with, uh, don't have a very high binding affinity, but since the glycans are present at su with such a large number of copies on, on cells, you, get, you still get strong binding because you can have millions of copies of, of a specific uh, glycan motif on a, on a cell. Um, so, so, and, and, and there's a huge repertoire of black and binding proteins with different specificities. Et so, so you'd be able to do something in pattern recognition, right? It's yeah, exactly. Like, like, like yeah. Okay. Thanks very much. Mike, my last, this is a quick question. You mentioned the, the work on xenotransplantation by knocking out uh, some genes that make these, these glycans. I was mm -hmm. curious of whether when you do such knockouts, does that affect the function of the organ or those are just glycans for that are immune recognition. And so the animal is, the, the organ function doesn't change when you knock out those. So, so usually glycans have multifarious functions. Uh, um, so, so it's not only for immune recognition, of course, but at least those transgenic pigs that have been generated still produce functional organs. And uh, at least it's not a, a major detriment to their function. Oh, okay. Thank you. 
Thank you. All right, great. Uh, next one up, we have Mike. How many questions do you have? <laughs> Actually, a couple. I posted one already. And I wasn't clear, even reading Wikipedia before listening to this talk, is are these glycans chemically bonded, like they're part of the protein molecules? Or are they just like a weak bond? They're sort of sticking to it. Like they're a separate molecule that's just like weak bonding to cells and viruses and other proteins. Yeah, I, I should have mentioned that. So they're, they're, they're covalently attached to the proteins and to lipids and to all other kinds of molecules. So that's, they're usually covalently attached. Oh, okay. So they're actually kind of like parts of other molecules, like a subgroup. Something like yeah, that. exactly. And the other thing is, I noticed there's these branch structures. Do they do they ever like reconnect, form more of a mesh structure, like a sheet or something, instead of a, it's a filament yeah. with branches? Uh huh. They, they would be fascinating. Yeah, so, so what, what definitely is true that the bacterial cell walls are cross connected, but that happens then via amino acids. So, so you have basically a mixture then of amino acids and and glycan structures. Um, but in terms of Glycan, pure glycan structures that are cross-connected. At least I haven't seen any. Um, could be that they're out there, but I'm not aware of them. Okay, well, thanks. Great talk. Thank you. I'm learning something new. I'd never heard of these things before. <laughs> <laughs> All right, are there any other questions from the audience? Yeah, I'll do, I'll do one more. Okay. So if no one else has something to do. Well, okay. So this is great. I'm loving this talk. I hope that I mean, in a way, this stuff needs to be taught in biology 101, at least near the end, right? Because first you get all this stuff and people, they make it, I mean, and you see this in Silicon Valley all the time, like computer scientists will learn the basics of molecular biology and they'll think, oh, it's very simple. You know, you've got genes, you've got proteins and that's, that's it, right? And then you've got proteins, maybe recognizing other proteins and all of a sudden I believe I'm qualified to start a vaccine company, right? And it's so much more complicated than that. And perhaps, you know, if people taught, sorry, I know this is a rant and not a question, I'll turn it into a question in a second. Um, and so if people learned like the basics of our um, knowledge about uh, glycans and all the glycosylated um, molecules and actually how little we know about them and how complicated they are in a biology class, then maybe they would both be humbled uh, to not, you know, think that it's easy, which a lot of, um, computer people seem to think the first time they set, step their foot in the water biology. And not only that, it'd be, it's inspiring because it's like, oh my God, there's all this stuff we can learn. I mean, on the one hand, it's, dis, it's, it's disheartening in a way because it's like, yes, yes, cancer, vaccines, you name it, is harder than we thought because there's this new class of molecules that's much larger and extremely important and, and complex compared to the linear molecules. I mean, it's like it makes the protein structure problem easy in comparison. So yeah, my question is, uh, do you teach? Do you teach a whole course on this? And what's the best reference for someone who knows molecular biology but doesn't know much about uh, the uh, glycans and their role? Where's the best resource? So I, I, I'll start I with the last part. Uh, yeah, exactly, and, and, and that's a book basically. So there is one, there's like the textbook um, that, is, that is slated for beginners in glycobiology and it's called Essentials of Glycobiology. And it's produced by, by a whole range of, of really founders of the whole field, like Rick Cummings and, and other people that contribute chapters to this book, basically. And, and it's freely available, by the way, online. So, so it's, uh, um, oh, you, wow. you, can, you can just read it as a, as a, as a PDF, et cetera. So, so that's really great. If you, if you want a paper copy, I think you have to pay to re, sort of reimburse the cost or something. But, but for the PDF, it's, it's completely free. Um, Teaching, I, I definitely plan on teaching that. So, I'm, so I'm, I'm, I, I will be on the hunt for, for faculty positions in the near future. And, uh, and, and I definitely plan to teach this so, um, as, a, as, a, as a faculty um, candidate. Because, because I think, as you said, it's, it's hugely important. Um, and and we, we are still, we're still barely on the cusp of, of un uncovering this diversity. Because we don't even know in humans, for instance, all glycans that are there. We don't have a full map of that. So there is the human glycome project, basically, but uh, we're oh. still not done, right? I mean, so with, with the genome, we're done for humans, at least. I mean, of course, there will always be something more to, to uncover. Uh, we know all, more or less all the proteins and all the RNAs, but for glycans, it's, it's still a very open book, and I'm, I'm, I'm very excited for the future, because it's going to be a wild ride, I think. 
Um, you've already like I think you know speculated about a few applications in you know like both agriculture but also potentially uh, you know human longevity. Could you kind of like speculate a little further in that? Like you know for you know what what could we be excited for if uh, you know if if people started to really dig into glycans more? That's a great great point. Yeah, and and, and I think um, I think it's especially in the in the therapeutic avenue. I think there are there are a lot of applications there, um, both in terms of of inhibiting deadly toxins uh, and 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 viruses, um, but also in uh, what I would really like to see is basically re-engineering our glycans. Um, because what I what I didn't get into a lot, but what what is definitely true is that a lot of signaling processes and uh, information. Uh, processing uh, biological mechanisms are modulated by glycan. So there are several signaling pathways like, like, like Notch and, and, and other very well characterized ones in humans that are modulated by the specific glycans that are on the proteins. Um, and, and, I, and I wonder if, if one could modulate that by, by just changing those glycans basically, because then you could uh, change human, the functions of human shell, cells without changing their genes. You know? So it's a very non-invasive, at least potentially non-invasive approach to modulating and better understanding ourselves. Wow, that would be wild. I mean, you know, that's a whole like a whole new research area. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> wow. Okay. Well. Uh, all right. We have Mike uh, with another. I, I guess like a little bit more <laughs> short-term question. Um, yeah, I had a question: Is are these glycans like specific to an individual in a species? Like each individual may have unique glycans molecules that only he has or is there like a shared set of a group of glycans within a species or even biology that kind of all members of that species have the same set of glycans yeah so so uh, it's basically a yes to both <laughs> so there are shared glycans that are shared between species and between higher taxonomic groups um, and, and that so both motifs as well as whole glycans are sometimes completely shared, but it's there's still very little overlap, at least in terms of whole glycans between species. In terms of individuals, it's actually quite interesting. So the heritability of glycans in humans, for instance, is, is around 60%. So, so it's, it's actually really, and, and it's not really clear where the other 40% are coming in, into play. So that may be epigenetics or, or, or other mechanisms that are it's environmentally influenced, basically, um, but at least a large degree of your of your glycans may even be unique. We don't know it as of as of yet because we don't know the full extent of the human glycome. Interesting. So it can be almost as unique as, say, an individual's DNA that you might have unique glycans as well. Yeah, yeah, there could be. And but 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 uh, what I what I do want to say is that of course the building blocks are species specific. So every single member of Homo sapiens will have the same building blocks to build glycans, but they can still build different glycan chains out of that. Oh, interesting, thanks. All right, I, I quickly had to move. Um, so I have a question um, regarding, okay, so if this was perhaps like, let's say like a more, um, a, a less invasive uh, way of actually, you know, and trying to, uh, trying to strengthen, uh, trying to strengthen our, uh, um, trying to strengthen the human body rather than, you know, actually having to genetically engineer anything. Uh, are there any risks associated with this approach that uh, would usually, that, that you could foresee? Yeah, so I think the biggest risk is cross-reactivity in a sense, because uh, especially as long as we don't know all of the glycans, so if you try to modify it, one or a group of glycans, you may not, you may also modify other glycans and then you get, you know, like a do, like domino stones, basically you get, you get effects that you don't foresee. So, so, so you would need to have very specific tools to modify specific glycans. Uh, at least that's what I, what I would think, because, you know, what, what, what you have to understand is that uh, you can have the same glycan chain in different proteins, but they can have different effects, right? Because I mean, if you, let's say you stabilize a toxin, it's going to be a very different effect than if you stabilize a life-giving protein, right? I mean, um, so, so even stabilization may have very different effects and, uh, and that can be mediated by the same glycan chain or different glycan chains. So, so I guess you need better understanding as of yet, at least, uh, to do those kinds of things. But, uh, but if you can do them, I think they will be very powerful. And could you maybe like, you know, via that also increase like interspecies, like transmittability of diseases or something, you know, if you like switched on the wrong ones? 
uh, that, so, so at, at least if you, if you give new glycans in a sense, I think if you take away certain elements, chances are lower at least, but, but, but let's say for instance, if you, if you provide the upper respiratory system with those duct, with more of those duct glycans, then those, those influenza viruses might have a, a lot of an easier job to spread into humans. Um, because we actually, so it's not that we don't have these lichens at all, but we have them in the lower respiratory tract. That means, um, so we can get something like H5N1, so, so bird flu basically. It's not human to human transmissible, but we can get it from birds. And then we get pneumonia because it's, it's in our lower respiratory tract. If it would affect our upper respiratory tract, it would be transmissible, at least in principle. And if we transmit, transmit those lichens, then that may happen. So we would need to be careful about that, of course. Man, okay, that's crazy. Can you speculate as to like why they are, uh, you know, currently being still neglected? Do you think we just haven't really gotten around to it yet, or you know, what what what's a good reason for that? Yeah, I, I think that one of the prime reasons is the lack of sequencing in a sense, because so for DNA we have of course DNA sequencing, which has gotten incredibly cheap over the over the last years and decades, and um, and so so that that's why DNA and RNA are so popular because they're so easy to study, um, in, a, in methodologically speaking. And, and even if you go into proteins, it's already, it's already a lot harder to do proteomics and just wholesale study proteins because you need to do methods that are a lot, lot more costly. And glycans top that because you, you, it's, it's a lot more diverse and you have a whole range of different sizes that you, that you have to look at basically in different categories of glycans. So it's, they're, since they're so heterogeneous, most methods don't tackle all glycans. They just tackle a certain class of glycans. And I think that really hinders a comprehensive study of them. But you know that could be solved by just having more data sets, right? Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, and, and and hopefully also then having more models and getting an understanding of what is actually important. Because you know even if you have different classes of glycans, there may be shared motifs between different classes that have the same function, right? And if you understand that, then you're not lo no longer restricted to classes per se, per se. And I think that will be really helpful. Wow. Okay. So, and uh, do you know of any other, uh, you know, person or even department or something using machine learning on those right now? Like, is there any other kind of like, is there any, is there any other effort out there to try to do this? So machine learning, not that is not, not that is published or that I'm aware. There are computational efforts, of course, for, for glycans that, that are trying to build different kinds of models for different kinds of applications. Um, but, but um, so, so mostly probabilistic models and, and, and uh, stuff like that, but at least for machine learning, uh, we are at the moment the, the only ones out there. So I, I would be happy if other people join the effort because I think it's very worthwhile. Crazy. Okay, so what's next for you then? What, what are you gonna focus on next? Yeah, so, so I, I definitely have a few projects to, to finish here and, and, uh, and there's always more work to do. I, I think, I, but long term, I definitely want to start my own group and really to dig into that and especially also tackle this problem of predicting what kinds of glycans a given biological system can produce just based on either its genome or, or, or other measures, basically, because that would really scale up the whole process by orders of magnitude, if you could do that, if you could employ existing technologies that are high throughput and just use models to translate that to, to glycobiology. All right, uh, we have one more question by uh, Mindy over here. Uh, Mindy, do you wanna unmute yourself? Yes. Uh just had, uh, can you hear me? All right. Um, so I just have this question I'm wondering is, is there a higher level, like a glycan representation language or an alphabet uh, other than plain UPAC uh, nomenclature, like, you know, uh, uh, nucleotides for, for DNA or uh, amino acids for proteins? There's, is there some kind of intermediary language or, or is there identified like maybe uh, fragments of those uh, glycans that are very commonly seen. Yeah, yeah. So definitely. So the what is what is commonly used nowadays is the uh, symbol nomenclature um, for 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 uh, for glycans, and and that's basically um, it's not a one letter code because there are there would be too many um, building blocks for that. Because you wouldn't have enough uh, just uh, um, letters for that. But but it's usually uh, a, for, at least for for the base sugar, it's a three letter code. So for instance, glucose, which is one of the, mo of the most um, common monosaccharides would have um, GLC or glic. And then um, it's, it's not a perfectly consistent nomenclature because some of the modified monosaccharides get their own letter code, whereas some of the other modified monosaccharides get basically like glic and then an additional 
tag to note to note that they're that they're modified. So there may be some work in the future to sort of homogenize that. That being said, there are efforts to try to create machine readable formats for glycan. So this was just like very long strings of uh, of symbols and text to uniquely describe a given glycan, and that may also be of complementary value. But I think from a language perspective, these uh, these um, Simple nomenclature may be very valuable in terms of um, comparability. I see. Yeah, that's very interesting because uh, that maybe would enable us to uh, to do some uh, higher level computational uh, reasoning on it. Yeah, yeah, and and, and okay. the same also, of course also for for patterns, right? They, they, if you have very common patterns, then then there are, at least for a lot of patterns relevant in humans, there are also names attached to that. Okay, we're now, uh, you know, at the hour exactly. So, uh, you know, we already talked a little bit about like what's next for you, but how could people help? Is there anything that you need? Uh, you know, I mean, you know, obviously uh, just kind of like a little bit more attention to this kind of like uh, uh, to, to this really newly emerging or not, not even yet started field, um, but what, what else is out there? What, what else, how could people help? Yeah, so, so I think attention is definitely a huge issue. Uh, just uh, to get people talking about it. And then of course, there's always funding. Um, so so we, we are, we're still operating with what we've got in terms of data and there is so much more out there. Um, so so we, in, in, our, in our most recent work, we, we, we looked at species distributions of glycans. And if you look at what species are out there and of, of which species do we have glycan data, it's, it's quite a paltry uh, comparison basically. So, so in terms of, um, so, so if, if, if um, even in terms of biodiversity, if anyone wants to, sort of really map biodiversity. I think glycans are the best candidate for doing biodiversity mining at the moment. And uh, so, so I, I would highly encourage people to, to, to invest effort and money into those kinds of things. All right, lovely. Okay, well, I'm gonna share. Uh, okay, Krian really, really wants to ask one last question. Do you still have a minute? Sure. Okay, so uh, this uh, sort of echo of a previous one, but different angle. You know, the, uh, the genetic code was discovered and in a way people thought, okay, we've got it. Like we understand how proteins are made from a code. And then we find out, oh my God, there's all this other stuff. There's post-translational modifications to proteins. There's feedback mechanisms that turn the genes on and off based on all sorts of outside information, much more complicated than we thought. Now we come with glycans, which are an even more complicated set of molecules. How dynamic is the glycan process in an organism like is it similarly i presume tons of genes and other factors that are being turned on and off that are turning out of that are like how how much uh, dynamics and sensitivity to the environment is involved how variable is the glycan repertoire and dynamics and geometry for a given organism during its life cycle and during its um various conditions that it will encounter in the environment yeah, so so that's very variable. So so that would be the very brief answer. So so glycans have been proposed to be the major mediator of phenotypic plasticity. So so basically, uh, how much can a, can a given organism change its phenotype um, just based on environmental influences? Uh, and, and and glycans are a prime su a prime suspect for for that. There have been also investigations into microbes that, that basically become pathogens upon environmental influences. And one of the mechanisms that they can do that is by by modifying their glycans. Um, Amazingly, actually, the number of enzymes for making glycans is not, it's not preposterous. So it's not, it's not like half of the genome is, is uh, encodes for, 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 for glycosyl transferases or something, right? So it's, in, in humans, it's, um, I, I'm not sure of the exact number, but it's in the, in the, in the dozens to low hundreds. Most, um, right. Well, that's like, that's like the number of enzymes that assemble a protein isn't that high. Yeah, exactly. right? yeah. But in, <laughs> so the glycans have this tree structure and there's basic operations like add one, add a branch, take one off, I don't know, how many can there be, right? And once you've got those elements, you can make any tree, basically, yeah. right? Yeah, 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 so, so that, that, that's true. And, and at least for, for, for humans, we have the most extensive coverage in a sense, and, and there we already know of thousands of different lichens um, that, that have different compositions uh, and that are uh, found at some point during the life, life science. So it's, it has been estimated that around two thirds of human proteins are, are glycosylated. Um, so basically nearly every protein that you will encounter has at least one glycan chain attached to it. And that can vary based on the phenotype. And antibodies are actually the, so IgG would be the prime example. So there have been dozens of different glycans have been described for this one glycosylation site in IgG. And 
all of them modulate the function of, of IgG. <laughs> all right, great. Uh, that was uh, four minutes over. Thank you so, so, so much for, for, for staying on. I think it was worth it. Um, Okay, so I'm hoping that you share with me uh, ways in which people can get in touch with you or contact you. Uh, I'm seeing like already like a few email chains forming here um, and um, you know, in, in, in ways in which people can help you out. I thank you so much for joining. I think, uh, you know, you've really blown a few minds here and that's I think hard with a few of our participants. So thank you so, so much for coming um, to everyone who is uh, still on. I invite you all. This is the last of the Foresight Sanity Preservers in its current form. Uh, and I think uh, we ended them with a bang. Um, tomorrow morning at 11 a.m. PT, uh, which should be 8, uh, 8 p.m. in Europe, we are going to start the Fawcett Hive Mind, which uh, is basically like a, kind of like a, the new, the, the next evolution after the sanity preservers where we're trying to um, basically get a little bit, uh, get our hands a little bit dirty and trying to see what kind of like long-term uh, changes we can actually uh, kind of like already uh, start to nudge from uh, COVID-19 right now. Uh, this will be more like a workshop, so it's going to be a little bit more hands-on, uh, but uh, please join. Uh, tomorrow we're going to start with uh, all the contributors uh, in one go. If you want to see who's contributing, please check out the website. Uh, for now, thank you so, so, so much, Daniel. This was fantastic. Uh, I can't wait uh, until this is online. Um, and yeah, I'm hoping uh, that uh, that we have you on uh, in the future when you have your own group working on this uh, and <laughs> a ton of attention on this. Um, and uh, yeah, we've basically decoded this uh, this new language. Okay, well, thank you so much. Thanks everyone. Have thank a lovely you. Great evening. <laughs> so it was a pleasure. Yeah. Bye-bye <laughs> everyone. <laughs>